Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about the work of community foundations with guests, Janissa Saul, CEO of the Baltimore Community Foundation, Antonio Hernandez, President and CEO of the California Community Foundation, and Neil Hadra, uh, CEO of the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation. So thank you all for joining us today. It's just so great to have you. Um, let's talk about community foundations and how you bring together financial resources, individuals, families, and businesses to strengthen local communities. It's such an important part of how American civil society works, right? It's, it's a really unique feature of, of how we function. So Shanisha, Shanisha, let's give the home court advantage since I was born in Baltimore and you're strengthening Baltimore communities. Uh, talk about how you function within the community and how you get to understand community need and connect people who want to give, who want to make a, co a contribution and assure that their investment gains the traction that they expect. Absolutely. Mark, thank you for having me. And always nice to have another Baltimore connection. We find that all roads do lead through Baltimore. <laughs> uh, and it's actually really nice to be on this call with Community Foundation colleagues. Um, um, I don't know how you all have experienced the last couple of years and certainly your tenures, but um, I've never been prouder to be um, a part of a community foundation um, its field and it's, um, it's important to the communities we serve. So it's a delight. And it's also nice not to have to explain what a community foundation is. Uh, usually that's the first thing I have to do, but on this particular call, I don't have to explain um, uh, what, what we do and why we exist. Um, well, you're, you're investment advisors, right? You're investment facilitators. You're, but the investment is really in people, in, in, in us all, in our communities, in our neighbor right over there, or the person over here who might have um, a, a, um, a disease or a need, right? We're, we're trying to help each other. That's right. That's right. I mean, we're this, we're this strange nexus of donors, uh, the private sector, residents, nonprofit organizations, and anchor institutions. Um, and we have created the space because we are created by and for the people of our communities to make a difference. Uh, and so we do leverage resources. I mean, we are, you know, in terms of our day-to-day -day work, uh, we leverage a significant amount of resources in the form of individual foundations or philanthropies. And we uh, try to mobilize those to the good of the community and based on donor intent. Um, and it is a um, it's an ambitious kind of strange, so really strange idea. Um, and when we are at our highest and best, we're doing um, doing well by the communities um, that we love and where we reside. And Antonio, in, in many respects, aren't you trying to heal the world, right? The various ills that we have, that we have within our power to address by creating those connections? Well, yes, and community foundations are just such a unique vehicle. We are a place-based organization. I tell people that my little piece of dirt is LA County. And a community foundation is two things. One, you know, we have 1,600 relationships with donors, with corporations. We also function like a foundation with discretionary funds that allow us to combine both to serve the needs of the community. Our value added is knowledge of the community that we serve. We know their needs. That's what we bring to our donors. And that's why we're able to connect. And you know, during this um, pandemic, it clearly showed the value of community foundation. Fast response, know the leadership, know who's doing what, and give funds immediately to those in need. One of the things that I think is so important is this idea of dialogue, right, across different boundaries. It's, it's so interesting how America works nowadays where we have uh, conservatives and progressives or liberals not talking to each other, people across racial boundaries or income boundaries not talking to each other. But if we don't talk to each other, we can't learn about each other. So Neil, one of the things that I think is, is so wonderful about community foundations is that it's all about connecting to people who are not necessarily like you, but who have a need that you want to address and you need their expertise, you need their connections, you need their community knowledge. 
in order to do that. that. That's right, Mark. But before I respond to that, I do want to go back to framing community foundations and advisors. And, and we are, there's no question that, you know, hundreds or thousands of donors and others come to us for our guidance. I do, however, want to posit, and Antonia touched on it, that we're also leaders. We have points of views. We have opinions. And we talk a lot at my institution about leading with impact. There is a trend among community foundations to become advisory services for donors, and there is nothing wrong with that, and we certainly engage with that. The danger is, is if we simply become a charitable checking account that's a pass-through between donors and community, where there is no singular institution that's really looking at the whole forest instead of the trees and, and, not, uh, and not following um, uh, the, what the community needs and rather focusing in on any one particular thing. And so I do think it's important for our field to acknowledge that we're actually leaders in our communities and not simply transactional uh, intermediaries. Um, and every great community foundation uh, that I've seen certainly embraces uh, that mentality. And I love how Antonia said um, her piece of dirt, our piece of dirt is one county in Michigan and that's where our boots are on the ground and that's what we focus on and, and we love being by the people and for the people in that sense to, to Shanaysha's point. So let's it, talk about how you come to your opinions, right? Because you yeah. come to your, they don't just come out of theory, they come out of practicality. So talk a little bit about how you hire people, how you cultivate the expertise so that you have foundational knowledge and evidence that underlies what you are recommending. Yeah, so Mark, this actually connects to the question uh, that you asked. So, so it comes down to what do we consider knowledge and data to be, right? And that definition has expanded over time. It used to be, at least in our institution, a bunch of smart people in a room thinking they knew best, right? Uh, our evolution was then listening to nonprofits because they were closer to the issues. But we've evolved another step further, as have many community foundations, which is saying, what about folks with lived experiences who actually have some of the answers uh, for what solutions would best serve them. Not all of the answers. We still respect expertise. We still respect institutions. Um, so we've evolved to say we have to integrate the voices of those with lived experiences into our decision making, into our strategies, uh, and into our activities. But I do want to take it one step further. I think to your point, we're uniquely situated to bridge different groups. Our donor base doesn't look a lot like those we serve, it, depending on the context. And so what we've uh, started doing is uplifting that community voice, not just for our own use, but actually uh, to bring uh, uh, unlike communities together to start building empathy and connection. So we've, um, we've commissioned a play, a dramatic performance to, to highlight the struggles of unpaid caregivers of older adults. Um, we actually, um, we commissioned a documentary um, on a group of young black men in our community uh, who made an album and then we hosted uh, the launch and you have never seen a more disparate and di diverse group of donors and community members coming together and we think that's going to be our secret sauce going forward and i want to push a little on that because neil says something's really important we tell the folks that we're more than grand makers we're conveners we're facilitators we offer convening space to the nonprofits and to the community. We have a convening center and we bring those people together to talk about issues. We sponsor over two dozen collaborations and coalitions of bringing people together. And just like Neil, I'll give you a really interesting example. Immigration is a very contentious issue. LA County is the epicenter of the world immigrants from any part of the world. What we did is, because we try to connect people at the human level, at the gut level. So what we did is we invited our donors. And like Neil said, many of them don't look like the people in need, predominantly, you know, well off, white, older individuals. And we took them to dinner. And at the dinner, at every table, we placed an immigrant undocumented immigrant to talk about their experience. And all of a sudden, everybody start, started talking about immigration. And then to really sort of kind of hold down the idea, we took them to see Hamilton. And it just brought the whole thing together. All of a sudden, these individuals connected to immigration, to the place they live in, in a very human way. It, it's not just the, their gardener that they know or their maid. They are connecting with the issue. So it's, it's, it's this thing emphasizing that our added value is knowledge of community and connecting people 
um, to the community because people give to people and people give to place. And it's love of people and love of place that connects people and, and in a human way. I talk about compassion. I don't talk about politics. I talk about empathy and that people understand whether you're in the far right or in the far left. So if I could just um, add on, I agree wholeheartedly with both of my colleagues um, in terms of how we operationalize our role as um, understanding community and our role as civic leaders. Um, so I think number one, um, philanthropy traditionally thinks about what it funds, the issues it funds, and by the nature of a community foundation where it funds, we're place-based. We've really focused on how we fund and how we work. And what that means is that we have to start by engaging community in a meaningful way. Um, um, our definition of community engagement is about how you enter a, a space where you are a guest and you learn how to be a listener and you learn how to build trust. And we operate with the belief that the solutions really could be, and it's not a platitude within the communities themselves and that the communities want to be a part of and be the architects of the future that we all wanna create that's better for everyone. Uh, but that requires a different position um, in terms of how we enter a room. Uh, we have to enter it with the willingness to be the ones ask, ask the questions rather than the traditional funder role where we're asking all the questions. Um, being willing to come back again to, to show up in places that are unexpected. Um, and it's the expectation of our team. And so your other part of your question mark was how do you sort of hire for and develop talent that's positioned uh, to execute. It is the expectation of our team to um, be willing to be boots on the ground. I mean, there's an aspect of our community in, in investment department where um, the mandate of the work is to give out grants, but the expectation is to be a listener first. And sometimes that means acting like part community organizer or community friend or helping with the cleanup. And we want people who can be accepted in the communities where we, um, where we work. The other thing I would just say broadly about how we hire, and this is very important to us, we feel like that we should grapple as a community foundation with the same issues that our region grapples with, which means we try to look like <laughs> um, the experiences that we see in our community. And that's not just along dimensions of race, although race is one dimension, um, it's along uh, dimensions of, of, of language, of nationality, of experience, of socioeconomic status. And we try to do that intentionally because that's what gives us the credibility to all of our stakeholders, donors as well as residents. Tanisha, we just finished a poll. It's very interesting, uh, kind of unexpected. We asked um, whether uh, people are aware, people who are attending this, this, uh, this discussion, are they aware of needs in the community? And we had 100% uh, of, of the people say yes. Um, Neil, do you feel that that people are generally aware of where the community needs are, and 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 that it's it's a matter of triangulation, um, or do you feel like there needs to be some information exchange between different segments of the community so that there is some sort of an agreement of where investment will gain most traction? So I don't want to speak for any other communities. I'll just make some observations about my own. Um, I Let me agree 100%. Everyone in our community has a set of issues they're aware of. What we find, though, is that there are bubbles in our community, and very few have a very broad-based knowledge of what's going on 15 miles east or west of your particular neighborhood or town or village um, or city. So we found that a huge value add of ours is providing some sort of county level information. So for example, we've been talking for years about life expectancy disparities based on geography and based on race. And, and I cannot tell you, Mark, the amount of shock folks have when they hear that there's a 10 year plus difference in life expectancy between an African American born and raised in our county uh, and, a, and, and a white person born and raised in our county. So those are things that we should know about and that we're positioned to teach people about. And what I find is most people do have some issue expertise, but they don't see the whole picture because frankly, that's not their job. They don't spend every day like we do, scanning, talking, learning, and to Shanaysha's point, um, embedding. So I think it's an incredibly important service we play as a community foundation to raise visibility of all of the issues and the macro issues uh, beyond the sort of the hammer the nail thing, right? Where if I'm into behavioral health, I know that's an issue, but I'm, I may not be aware of the lack of, of effective food systems to deliver nutritious meals to people. So your point is basically that we know what we know, right? But we don't necessarily know what we don't know. 
And part of what you're doing is you're bringing people together so that they are constantly informed, not necessarily about what they already know, but what where their blind spots might be. Yeah. And, and let me just extend that for one second. The other thing is we don't also want to be a hammer where everything's a nail. So we're also really um, careful to recognize an ecosystem. There are issues that are very important to our community that we are not best situated to lead. Um, housing and homelessness, we're very involved in, but there is a very large collaboration that we don't lead that takes HUD money and does a lot of great work there. So we are alleviated of that pressure of having to lead on every issue. And so part of our education to donors and to community members is also who is doing what about these issues. And that's where there's also a, a very low level of knowledge, because again, this isn't, this isn't people's day jobs. It's not their job to know who's working on behavioral health, who's working on hunger, who's working on housing, right? And so we also bring that to the table. Antonio, you were going to uh, make a comment? Yeah, you know, it's generally people know what ails their community. And, and, and that's half the issue. It's knowing the solutions and being practical about the solutions. We all know that homelessness is a very serious issue. It's a very complex issue. So the question is, we all know homelessness is an issue. What are the solutions? What are the options? At, at the California Community Foundation, we fund in this area, not only grant making to nonprofits that are building low income housing, but we also have a program related investment loan portfolio for the nonprofits. And we also have a loan, pro, uh, a loan uh, portfolio for the private sector that's building low income housing. So it's not just knowing the issues, but knowing how to deal with those issues. And I'll give you another example. This pandemic has, we all knew, but this pandemic has really unveiled the fact that poor people are not connected to the internet. And this is a serious problem, both for the urban area, as well as for the rural area. Well, the fact of the matter is that if you're not connected to the internet, you can do virtual education, you can do virtual medicine. And all of a sudden, here it is. Well, con connectivity is the civil rights issue that has come out. And so what are we doing about it once again? You know, is what are the solutions? How do, you know, it's, it's working with the private sector, but it's also how do we, uh, uh, how do we come together and put together a plan for public access for people? Because, you know, you might have connectivity, but can you pay the $100 when you're earning $15 an hour? So I think the issues are extraordinarily complex and getting people together, not just to understand the need, but what are the solutions and how can community organize to come together to agree on several of the solutions so that we can work together. So I think it's not just knowing the problem, but understanding how to resolve it. Antonia, you, you're, you're stating uh, quite clearly that some of your investments are short-term investments and some of them are very long-term investments that unfold over years. Uh, Shanisha, um, when you look at your investment mix, uh, you have a certain amount that you can uh, fund and then you can sometimes engage new donors to fund other initiatives. But how do you look at your mix of short-term investments, annual uh, giving uh, versus multi-year grants? Yeah, so I'm gonna answer your immediate question, but I wanna go back to Antonia's point about the digital divide. Uh, so in terms of your immediate question, um, we believe that particularly for small community-based nonprofits, it is problematic to give large amounts of money on a one-time basis. And so particularly when it comes, we're talking about outside of an emergency response, particularly when it comes to partners that are doing um, um, good work, they're credible in their communities, um, and, but they may have some capacity issues, we believe that you have to give multi-year grants or at least signal that this is a multi-year commitment and that we're not gonna go away um, once we get bored or after a couple of years, because so you're managing expectations, right? That's right. That's right. But it, it, we believe that's our obligation, particularly to um, to smaller nonprofits. So that's the immediate answer there. I do want to go back to Antonia's point about the digital divide, and I think it connects to your your point about the short term and the long term. So the digital divide is a great example where we saw an immediate need, right? 
there were people who were had, had to, to go to their home. They had to figure out how to go to school, how to work, how to get information, how to get entertainment, how to get um, medical care, so on and so forth. Um, and so there was a rapid response to provide free internet for a period of time and devices. That's the short-term solution. The longer-term solution where community foundations are particularly well-positioned and, and BCF has been proud to, to co-lead these efforts is to think about what is the long game around the digital divide such that we're not in the same situation, such that we know that in the creation of the new normal that we're gonna have to address access to the internet, uh, adoption, um, as, well as, um, uh, as, as well as devices. And that is where our convening role plays an extraordinary um, um, part, as well as our ability to be advocates. And that is to advocate with the large ISPs um, to our, our, our government officials to make sure that the policies and the laws are such that um, low-income families can get the same quality of internet that I have, because it is now a central uh, part of our life. It is the infrastructure upon which we live. And that is a way that we can, that we can learn from a short-term crisis and make it into long-term solutions where everyone can benefit. But you're also engaging businesses through your networks in thinking about the opportunity, the business opportunity, also in collaboration with government entities, uh, the societal needs, because businesses are part of our fabric, right? They're not alienated from it. They need your intelligence that they don't necessarily um, engage with in, in a boardroom where, they're, where their mission is to pursue profits. Um, there also are opportunities to have these businesses respond in other ways, um, in addition to their philanthropy, right? So, Mark, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I want to second Shanaysha's point about the long game. I, and I just want to observe that is a unique value proposition that community foundations bring to the table. Um, we can take the long view because we're based on permanent endowment. We can talk in five and 10 year chunks in a legitimate and genuine way. And that is such a rare luxury. I, I used to be at a Fortune 5 company where the quarterly reports really dictated what we did, right? So even at the largest of the you know capital-based systems, there was still short-term thinking. And so we always talk about the balance between how do we have a sense of urgency, but never lose the long game because very few in our community can take that long view. And to Shanaysha's point, build five and 10 year uh, strategies. In terms of business engagement, I'll give you an example of an initiative we've been working on for five years now, but we have 28 high uh, um, tech company CEOs who've committed equity to a board governed fund at the community foundation. This is a way not only for them to have skin in the game and the community's needs, but also defer to us on how those funds are used. These are not donor advised funds. They have entrusted our board and our staff to make decisions on how those funds are used as companies exit and as there's a benefit. I do wanna acknowledge that businesses matter. They're a huge force uh, in our society. So collaboration with business is really important. Um, and just as important, it's important to help businesses understand that they too have a very tunnel vision on their view, right? Um, we we're working with a woodworking company uh, that saw every answer through how to engage staff in woodworking. And we help them understand there's a lot more to solutions than that particular piece, but they can play a role in that. It's interesting when we triangulate some of our discussions, we had a uh, great show um, the other day with uh, African-American uh, leaders of, uh, leaders of African-American Chamber of Commerces. Right, and this whole idea of community and business, and how do you change the constellation of opportunity within communities uh, in collaboration with with others in your network to shift the wealth gap? You know, we talk about the astonishing gap in life expectancy between uh, people of color and people who are white or and based in wealth, but there's also this whole issue of of where. Uh, wealth accumulates in this country through historical uh, injustice. We have an imbalance uh, here. Uh, Antonia, how do you deal with those kinds of massive societal issues, which are not necessarily within the power of any one organization to redress, but there is this sort of, if you're gonna change a system, you have to kind of create a systemic response. How do you, through your work, uh, push on these massive issues, climate change, you know, how, how climate is affecting people in your area or uh, wealth uh, gaps or uh, crime on the streets. Uh, how do you look at those, those issues? Well, first of all, you know, we started by saying community foundations understands the needs of community. And so our understanding is 
you know, the need of the community, uh, the poverty, um, you know, sort of the discrimination. And if you think about it, we're an important part of society in our local community, but we're a very small part. Most of the funds that go to help poor people are government funds. And so we have to partner with the public sector. And then the Chamber of Commerce and the business, you know, LA is what the 15th economy of the world, but we're not like your typical economy. It's small, mid-sized businesses. They're not the huge businesses. We're not corporate centers, but we can work with business and actually allow them. And Neil said this, you know, CCF has been around for 106 years. We function under 10 year strategic plans. We're not voguish. We're not gonna go anywhere. So we give these private sector businesses, you know, partnerships that allow them to work through us for a longer term that they're capable of doing because they're looking at the quarterly returns. So it's bring a, a community foundations, we're truly the bridge. We have to work to be effective we have to work with the private sector, with the public sector, and philanthropy together because not one sector can solve a problem. It's going to take the collaboration of the three sectors. And the more community foundations realize this, the more you're going to see not only short-term solutions, which are wonderful. You know, it's, it's like this. I tell people, people are hungry. We're going to feed them now. But then we ask the next question, why are they hungry? Why don't they have access to quality food? That's the long one, is to answer the why. Meet the immediate need, but answer the why and work on that. We're advocates. You know, we stay within the law. We lobby in the state legislature and the county for long-term solutions. So, you know, the beauty of community foundations is we can do it all. We can do it all, and that's our mandate. So, you know, on this point about small businesses, so Baltimore is a similar market. So we have um, our corporate community is much more of a small and mid-sized uh, business community, and it's not as large as it used to be. And the the sectors are changing for all kinds of reasons. Um, so under the pandemic, what we all had to realize, we were forced to realize as a broad community, is that. Um, by people of color uh, were less likely to receive PPP loans, they were more likely to, to go under, et cetera, et cetera. And so now we are working with uh, the small business community, the banks, uh, the state governments, the local government and other foundations to think about loan loss reserve pools, questions like the CDFI ecosystem to make sure that CDFIs are given the, the amount of technical assistance uh, support um, as well as the capital in order to provide grants uh, particularly to small businesses, because what we all know is that the small businesses and the mid-sized businesses are often engines of, of communities in which we live. So and I think it's a great way that we have these different sectors working together. And the fund is housed at BCF. Uh, and so they saw the community foundation as kind of um, as uh, the nexus upon which everyone could convene, uh, aggregate their capital, and then make thoughtful decisions about how to allocate those dollars. And, and Mark, 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 point. Neil, I'm going to give you the last word because we're coming oh. to the end of our end of our time. We it's it's just we could do this for another half hour, uh, but sadly we we will we will come to the end of our time. Um, I do want to point out we just completed two polls, and then Neil, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you have the last word to uh, to see us out. Um, uh, the first poll was interesting. Uh, we asked, um, have you ever worked with a community foundation to help you ma uh, materialize your philanthropic, philanthropic vision? And 60% of respondents said yes, and, and, and felt that the knowledge that you all brought was incredibly helpful. And then we also asked, what sectors? We asked people to pick uh, up to three. What sectors uh, do you feel require the most investment? And we had a pretty even split between children and family, education, uh, environment and health, um, with um, with uh, uh, arts, media, and culture basically um, taking a, a slightly reduced uh, level. So you have a a real consciousness uh, of need out there. Uh, Neil, could you uh, take us out if 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 you were going to leave us with the kernel of wisdom? 
that can guide our actions and our interaction with community foundations, uh, what would that be? Man, I did not want the last word. Um, <laughs> what I will say is, what I will say is, it depends on your community and you can look to your community foundation to help guide you in answering that question. Um, it, it, I've been so inspired by Antonia and by, by Shanesha. Every time I have a conversation, Mark, with other CEOs of community foundations, I hear so many parallels, but also appreciate that we each serve a very different region of our country. So my kernel of wisdom is the answer varies from region to region and community to community, but what you'll find consistently across the 900 community foundations in this country is you can look to a community foundation to help guide your path forward and how you can make our community a better place. We're so fortunate to have your leadership and that of your staffs and your board. Um, I, I, I wanna recognize all of, your, all of your community members, the people who give in different ways, who receive in different ways, the donors who receive and the grantees who give. Right. I mean, this is really where we can come together and change the country. Janisha Saul, CEO of the Baltimore Community Foundation, Antonio Hernandez, uh, President and CEO of the California Community Foundation, and Neil Hadra, uh, CEO of the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's just been wonderful, wonderful. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.